I think the remarkable thing about the museum that we're in right at the moment is that it is the legacy of two people, John and Mabel. John Ringling was a tall, not very gregarious fellow, 6'1". Uh, Fred Bradna, who was a uh, friend of the Ringlings, said of him that he was big fellow with drooping eyes and a very low voice. Mabel, on the other hand, was a very, very beautiful woman who had great interests in art and in music, and they both loved traveling, especially to Italy. And so this complex really reflects their love of the arts. As John Ringling said, you know, life is short, but art is long. And that there is a gloriousness about this complex because it is a museum, the art museum, very much of the taste of the person who pulled it all together. Mabel Ringling, on the other hand, just loved the gardens. And the Rose Garden is her legacy on the property. But for both of them, the house, Katazan, was the stellar piece because it was going to be the house that people went to to see what Sarasota could become. And later, because John Ringling did not need to make a museum of the circus. He had the living circus. And not only did he have the living circus, but he had the greatest show on earth. The starting of the circus museum happened after John Ringling died. There was 10 years of litigation on the estate. And finally, in 1946, the estate opened and the art museum was open permanently, and the Cadizan in December of 1946 would open up, and over 15,000 people came to the opening to see where the Circus King lived. The first director was the person who gave us the Circus Museum as well as the historic Oslo Theater. And I don't think that one can tell the story about the museum without mentioning A. Everett Austin a brilliant Renaissance man who came to Sarasota, as one person said, he always had the first of everything. What he saw that other people later on have had great problems with is the highbrow and the lowbrow. And that has always been a tension here at the complex because it's the circus museum. It's taken Howard Tibble's model circus. It took the Smithsonian's Folklife Festival, uh, celebrating the 50th anniversary of the Folklife, to add the circus, to make people realize that the circus is an art form, and its performers are not performers, they're circus artists. And so what Austin did was start a circus museum because number one, Tremendous circus collections were just in town because of all the families. And not only were the families in town, but you had winter quarters. And hundreds and thousands of people came to Sarasota to see the home where the cocoon would be emerged from for the next season of The Greatest Show on Earth. And so he saw he could get people to come to the museum when they might not just come for Baroque art. Charles and John Ringling would get involved with the development, and they were wonderful boosters of this town because they would put advertisements in the circus program every year saying, spend a summer this winter in Sarasota. A perfect place to come because it helped their real estate. People would come to the uh, winter quarters, people would stay in hotels. It was an underpinning of keeping Sarasota buoyant when the Florida land boom was coming on. 
And so bringing winter quarters down here had a number of great reasons. Number one, the, Barnum, the old Barnum and Bailey um, winter quarters was in Bridgeport, Connecticut. It's cold up there. There was needed some place larger to bring all the animals and all the tents and all the equipment needed for the show. And so John Ringling brought the winter quarters in and announced it in March 23rd of 1927. And the newspaper would banner it saying, Ringling Circus coming home to Sarasota, the biggest historical event in Sarasota's history. One of the great things that John Ringling was the best of was routing the circus. So every year you would route from one town to the next town, taking into a lot of considerations how far it was, how many people the town had. Was it after the time that the area had brought in the harvest? So people had money in their pockets to be able to spend on this one year event, which was the circus coming to town. And again, we just don't understand what a magnet, what a force the circus was. Miles long parades would go through your town. It would stop traffic. Schools would let out. Stores just gave up and closed shop because everyone went to see this mile long parade of beautiful women on high stepping horses, lions and tigers, wagons full of clowns all being a Pied Piper that would lead you out to the lot, a massive lot with massive tents and a throng of people waiting to get in to see the greatest show on earth. Charles and John Ringling were very involved with Sarasota. And as the economy was becoming not as robust, they saw it as an opportunity to bring winter quarters down here to support their town, because very much they were part of the town. They were presidents of the Chamber of Commerce. They had banks here. They were investing into Sarasota to make it a great town. And what does great towns have? Amenities. And what is an amenity but any kind of entertainment that helps people, draws people to a town? And Winter Quarters just did that. It brought the excitement of the circus to the front door of Sarasota, Florida. It also allowed people in town to run away with the circus very easily. And many people did that. But the Winter Quarters not only did it help Sarasota, one circus historian has said it was the death of one town and the birth of another. And I think when you see it in that context, it was a Bush Garden before Bush Gardens. It was a Disney before Disney. It was the number one attraction that drew thousands, hundreds of thousands of people every season to this town. In spite of the absolute glory of Sarasota's natural beauty. One of the managing principles of the Ringling Show, which the five brothers maintained throughout the history was, we divided the work, but we stood together. Fred Bradna would say they were like a many-headed hydra that they could see in all directions. And so each of the brothers had specific jobs to do. Charles was personnel, as well as advertising. He loved the posters. And so many of the posters that he had made by the Strobridge Company and Russell Company, and other companies, Charles had a finger on that. They wanted horses to look like horses. They wanted the thrill of the circus to be communicated through the poster. And that was Charles' job. He was also circus personnel and he oversaw, he stayed with the circus throughout the season. He didn't do what John Ringling did, was they, he would come in for 
a management meeting with the brothers and then leave again because he was the advanced man. He went ahead. He planned. A story of uh, John Ringling was that if you took down the window in his railroad car and he stuck his finger out, he could tell you what county and what town was coming up, no matter where he was in the United States. A lot of people from all over the United States came to Sarasota in the early years. Uh, there is a wonderful hard link between Chicago and Sarasota. Owen Burns, Bertha Palmer, but it continued throughout the years that people would come here. And if one has lived in a Chicago winter, one could understand how you would want to spend a summer this winter in wonderful Sarasota, Florida. The amenities were fantastic, fishing and the beautiful, beautiful weather. But John Ringling and Charles Ringling decided to really put their feet down into the community and become not just a winter resident, a snowbird, but to have connections. For John Ringling, it was he wanted to make a European luxury resort that people would be drawn to. And Lido Beach, wonder why he called it Lido Beach. Italian, the Italian structure that he built as his home, he all had harkens back to his view of the grandeur that Sarasota could have in its prestige as a town. And if you go upstairs on the second floor of Cadizan and you look out the window in John Ringling's office, almost everything you see he owned. He owned 2,000 acres of Longboat Key. He owned Wolf Key, Coon Key, St. Armand's, Lido, as well as uh, Bird Key. And John Ringling saw it. He saw the potential and he saw what he personally could do. But what does any important town have? Well, they have historic places, and maybe they have a historic house that's of note, and they might have a museum. But John Ringling wanted to make it more than just a museum. He wanted to make his art museum an encyclopedic collection so people from all the Southeast could come down and see the great art of Europe, as well as understanding that to really connect with the community, he had to have an educational feature. And so he created in 1931, the Ringling College, which is now one of the most, fa the fastest growing colleges of art and design. Not only did the school thrive, but was a magnet to bring people again to town, talented, creative people. And if you look at what is important in a great community, it is that wonderful creativity, the depth of the experience of not only art, but performance. But the Ringling College has under Larry Thompson, transformed itself as the place to you have to go to learn about all the new technologies. You learn about the old way of drawing, but on top of that, you get the experience of the virtual reality, and we have become a funnel to Disney and all of their films, the great, and we've won um, Oscars for it. So, I mean, Ringling, not only did he give an imprint in this town, but he has a living imprint that shows his view of education. He more than likely had a McGuffey reader background. He didn't go to a lot of, a lot of schooling at all. He was self-taught and he learned what great art was. John Ringling would be so thrilled by 
the Ringling College. And the reason I think he would be is because Larry Thompson is very much the showman that John Ringling was. And he has shepherded this school into the 21st century and beyond. You can go for filmmaking, virtual reality, animation, and augmented reality. It is the place in the United States that is creating a new way, not only to make film, not only to make animation, but also to be able to speak to younger people and draw them in to the wonderful world of the creative. Sometimes you're really lucky and you stumble into something that really changes your life. And that for me, has been the Circus Arts Conservatory. It's first started and has its roots in winter quarters of the Ringling Show because so many people lived here in Sarasota who were circus artists. And then the high school created in 1949, the Sailor Circus. And there, through the Circus Arts Conservatory, you have the living legacy of John Ringling and the circus. It is there that you can see globally the great artists of the world coming to Sarasota, Florida to perform every winter. For me, the transformational thing was to look up in this single ring big top and see Dolly Jacobs fly through the air defying what one considers what the human body can do, defying even gravity to float through the air as a ballerina. Let me tell you, if you were a visitor in Sarasota, Florida in 1951, there was only one story, and that was the greatest show on earth that was being filmed. The Cecil B. DeMille was on the streets, Gloria Hutton, all of them were part of this larger community. And then in February, when they filmed the Great Circus Parade, all the extras were paid 25 cents an hour, and many people got their first social security cards because they wanted to line Main Street up with throngs of people that it would have been just like if you had been at the circus coming to town. When The Greatest Show on Earth came out, there was a premiere in Sarasota at the Edwards Theater. Can you imagine seeing the film and everyone sitting in the seats were the performers, Walendas, the uh, Jacobs, the uh, Cooksey, the Midget, the Dolls family, they were all there. The performers who were in the audience would clap when they would see themselves and the roar of a claim that your picture was on the great screen, but also that it documented your time on the greatest show on earth. A dear friend of mine was Lillian Birds, an eminent Sarasota historian. And she, would, she was born in 1913. And it was just such a unique experience to see through her eyes how Sarasota had grown and how Sarasota has changed. And the one thing she always told me was, change is inevitable, but the decisions on how things change are not. And so my hope for Sarasota is that change is part of life, but that we really work hard on looking at the humanity that we are creating in our community, that we look at what can be done to improve the environment in Sarasota, how we can work more together in creating a Sarasota that would be beyond John and Mabel's dreams.